Today in Unit 4, uh, this is going to be our eighth lesson. This is going to involve system of equations. This comes from actually Chapter 8, Section 1. So we'll bounce around just a little bit here. Um, system of equations, what happens is, you know, when, when you do research to be cost effective, developing math models is a very good tool. Systems of, of equations is, is one of those models to help understand business models, especially if you're trying to like maximize profit or minimize cost. They come in really handy. Um, so what we're going to learn is a system of equations involving two variables. Again, the models can get much more complicated. And to solve them, you know, technology is often used um, to save time. So um, like I said, technology is a great si uh, time saver. But just to kind of understand a little bit of the math that goes behind it, it's a good idea to do something that's a little bit more manageable, like a two-variable uh, two uh, system of equations. So one of the things is if you have two unknowns, to have a system of equations, you have to create two equations. If you have three unknowns, then it's important to maybe develop three equations with those with that information. So it has to kind of have this two by two or three by three kind of look or, or, or more. So that's a big part of the system of equations. The ones we're going to deal with today are a system of linear equations. And we're going to first start by looking at graphs. Remember, a linear equations is when you had ax plus by equals c, where again, the exponents of the x and y were both up a degree of one. So to have a system of equations, we're going to have two linear equations, ax plus by equals c, and dx plus ey equals d would represent the uh, second equation. So what happens with the system of equations is there's all kinds of ways to solve them. One of the ways is if we graph the lines, the solution actually will be the, the point of intersection. So if the two graphs, if the two lines actually are graphed and there is a point of intersection, in other words, there's one solution. So if there's one solution, and again, that solution will be represented most commonly as an ordered pair. The system is described as consistent and um, independent. Independent. There you go. That looks a little bit better. Something like that. So in your homework, they may ask you if, if there's one solution, how is that system described? Well, it'll be described as consistent and independent. So if I gave you the equation 2x minus y equals negative 1, and if I give you negative 4x plus 6y is equal to 42, again, we could make a table to graph these, but remember linear equations, there's also this form y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to use the slope first step form to graph these. So again, to use the slope first step form, you have to get the y on one side. So if I subtract 2x on both sides, I end up with this negative y equals negative 2x minus 1. And then to get y by itself, I have to divide each side by negative 1, which is going to just change the signs. I'd have y equals 2x plus 1. So that would be the equation for the first line. If I want to solve this next one, I'll try to use a different color here. Again, I would move this negative 4x to the other side of the equation, so I'd add a 4x to both sides. So this turns into 6y equals 4x plus 42. And then to get rid of this 6, we divide each side by 6. So I divide each term on the right side by 6 as well. So this turns into a y, and this turns into a 4, 6, x. And then 46 divided, 42 divided by 6 would be 7. And then 4, 6 actually is a reducible fraction. So it doesn't turn into an integer, but I can divide each one of the, the numerator denominator by 2. And that reduces it down to an equivalent fraction of two thirds. So instead of using the four six, I'm going to use the two thirds x plus seven. So in graphing these, so if I want to graph y equals two x plus one, the first thing I recognize is the y intercept is at one. And then the slope is two, but remember, slope is a ratio of the change in y over the change in x. So we also use that phrase rise over run. 
So to locate another solution that's on the line from the, the, the y-intercept, we want to rise up to one, two, and run over one, and that'll create a second solution. And so what we can do then is graph these two lines. Well, I'm going to graph this line to start with, see if I can do that. I'm going to rise up two, run over again, rise up two, run over one again. Let's go down two, left one, get some points there. Help me keep a steadier hand as I did this. Okay. So I have something like that. So we have this graph here. Now, the other graph is we have this y equals two thirds x plus seven. So the y-intercept would be seven. And again, the slope is gonna be two thirds. So I can't really go up and over. So I'm gonna go down two and left three. So down two and left three, one, two, three. Down two and one, two, three. So I'm gonna see that my, this line here, I'm gonna do that in purple though. So this line here will be going like this. Got to get a little closer to my dot. All right. So try that again. And I'll set, you know, somewhere up here, they would have intersected. So we kind of see that there would be this intersection point if I extend those off, off my graph, I could actually see that there would have been an intersection point uh, around in this area here. You know, so again, a lot of times with, with graphing this, you'd be like an estimation. It almost looks like it would be like maybe five, uh, maybe 510 or 511, somewhere around there. So notice how graphing has its shortcomings because sometimes we can't actually get the point of intersection on the graph but that would be considered consistent and independent. So looking at another example, some systems will not have a solution. So this happens when the two lines are parallel. This system is described as inconsistent. So inconsistent means there is not a solution. There's not a point of intersection. So if I want to try to graph these two lines, again, solving for y, I have y equals negative two x plus five. If I try to solve this one for y, let me bring that over here. So I have four x, let me rewrite that. And so I have four x plus two y is equal to eight. So, So if I subtract 4x on both sides, that gives me 2y equals negative 4x plus 8. And if I divide each side by 2, this gives me then negative 2x plus 4. So if I graph these two lines, again, the first one, the y-intercept is 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That saves the trouble making a table. And the slope is negative 2, so that means to go down 2 and write 1 down two and right one, that would be a negative slope where the line should be decreasing from left to right. So the graph should look something like that. So then if I graph that the other one, the y intercept is at four and the, and the slope again is down two over one, down two over one. And you can kind of see that this line is also gonna be kind of, well, to my best ability here, though those lines are supposed to be running side by side, so they are considered parallel. So since they're parallel, we would describe this as no solution or inconsistent. So we would say no solution, which also applies to uh, inconsistent as the description. Sometimes the system has infinitely many solutions. This happens when the two lines are coincided. In other words, they're on top of each other. We describe this system as um, consistent and dependent.
So if I want to graph 2x plus y equals 4, solving for y, I have y equals negative 2x plus 4, subtracting 2x on both sides. To solve the next one for y, we have um, negative 3y. I'd add it to 6x on both sides, and that would equal 6x minus 12. And then if I divide, divide both sides by negative 3, y would equal then 6 divided by negative 3 would be negative 2x. And negative 12 divided by negative 3 would be a plus 4. So when you graph these two lines, you know, the first one would be the y-intercept would be 4, and the slope would be down 2, right 1, down 2, right 1. So that I have the first line. But notice the second line, again, the y-intercept is 4, the slope is down 2, right 1. Notice the second line is actually coincident, it's on top of the first line. So when this happens, we describe the solution as infinitely many solutions. So the solution set would actually be the equation of the line. So we could say the set of uh, X is, or set of order pairs, I should say, the set of order pairs such that those order pairs are on the equation, Y equals um, negative two X plus four. So the solution is actually a set of order pairs such that they're on the equation y equals negative 2x plus 4. So I could write that kind of using set builder notation like that if I wanted to. So notice how graphing has its limitations because if, this, if the intersection is like a fraction or a decimal, or you just don't have a big enough graph to identify the point of intersection, the, it becomes very difficult to see the solution through graphing. So what we're going to do is learn a couple of methods to solve it using more of, a, of an algebraic strategy. So the first strategy we're going to talk about is solving a system of equations using what's called the substitution method. So basically, there's four steps that we want to follow in the substitution method. We want to solve one of the equations for either x or y. If possible, look for the variable whose coefficient is 1 and, and solve for that variable. Secondly substitute into the second equation and solve. And then third, substitute this answer to find the remaining variable. Now, if there is only one solution, the two lines intersect at this point. Again, we write the solution as an ordered pair. The solution will be described as consistent and independent. So if we follow the strategy, again, it says solve one of the equations for either X or Y, it doesn't really matter. Just look for the variable that looks easiest to isolate on one side. If I look at this equation here, notice that the y does have a coefficient of one. So what I wanna do is solve this equation for y. When I use this method, I like to write the equations side by side as well. If you notice how I wrote those on paper. So if I'm gonna use this method, I like to write the equations side by side to start with. So if I solve for y, I get y equals um, negative 2x minus one. So what we do now though is substitute into the second equation for y. So the, the next thing I do is I'm gonna have this, um, this equation negative four X plus six. And what I'm gonna actually do is I'm gonna replace y with negative two X minus one and then I'm going to have then equals this 42. That's the substitution method. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stay with one color from here on for myself here. So I have negative 4x plus then 6 times negative 2 would be a negative 12x, and 6 times a negative 1 would be a negative 6, and that would equal then this 42. So to solve this equation, you notice how it's linear. So to solve a linear equation, you want to simplify each side of the equation first. So again, I already wrote the parentheses. So now I have to combine like terms. So I'm gonna have negative 16x minus six is equal to this 42. And then we have to add a six to both sides. So negative 16x is gonna equal 48. Six, 42 plus six is 48. And then if I divide each side by negative 16, I have to use a calculator for that, but it looks like three, negative three would be the value for x. So, like I said, solved one equation for either X or Y. Well, we solve for Y. Step two, 
substitute into the second equation solve. We substitute into the second equation and solve for x. Now what we want to do is we want to substitute this answer to find the remaining variable. What I do is I substitute that back into the original equation. So this y equals this negative two x minus one. I'm going to substitute x back into that so I can solve for y. So y equals uh, negative two x times negative three minus one. So it's going to be y equals six plus minus one. So y would actually equal uh, a five. So since there was only one solution, we write that as an order pair. So this list should be um, negative three, five, if we write, write it as an order pair. So that would be, if I graphed the two lines, that would be the point of intersection. So another strategy we have besides the substitution method is what's called solving a system of equations using the elimination method. So in this method, what we like to do is write the equations underneath of each other. The goal is to rewrite one or both of the equations so that one of the variables has the same coefficient, but is opposite in their signs. Add the two equations together to eliminate one of the variables. And then step four, if both variables are eliminated, we have to pay attention to some stuff here. If both variables are eliminated, if the remaining equation is false, then this, this means that the two lines are parallel and we would describe the system as inconsistent. In other words, there's no solution. If the remaining equation is true, then the two lines are coincident and would be described as um, consistent and dependent. So if, if we, the remaining equations are being a true statement, what this means is the two lines lie on top of each other. So the solution itself would be all the order pairs that are on that, on that line. So kind of how we did that a minute ago. If one variable remains, what we do is we solve and then substitute the value into one of the equations to find the remaining value. This will represent the point of intersection and the system is described as consistent and, and, and independent. Now, most of the problems we're gonna do is gonna fall into the category of number five. Typically, they're gonna give us equations where there is actually gonna be a solution. So what we wanna do is again, using the elimination method is first off, we write the equations underneath each other like that. Now the catch is I want the coefficients of one of the variables to be the same, but different in sign. Notice how the X's have one's positive and one's negative. If I could make the bottom X turn into a negative two X, then the X's would actually eliminate. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna multiply this equation by two, because by multiplying by two, that's gonna create my coefficient of negative two X there. So the first equation, I'm not gonna do anything to it because I've already got what I want. Two X plus three I is gonna equal one. But the second equation, I'm gonna multiply everything on both sides by this two. So this gives me a negative two X plus this two Y, and that's gonna equal then this negative six. So both sides get multiplied by that two. So that was, I believe, the, the second step. So that's the goal, is rewrite one or both the equations so that one of the variables has the same coefficient but opposite side. So I didn't have to change the top equation, I only had to change the bottom equation. Now I can add the two equations together and notice that the X's do eliminate. This leaves me with five Y and then one plus negative six would be a negative five. So this enables me to solve for y. So if I divide both sides by five, this gives me five or y equals negative one. So what we do now is we substitute the y equals negative one back in, and I usually like to pick one of the original equations. It looks like the bottom one actually looks easier. So I'm gonna actually pick the negative x plus y equation equals three. That one looks like the easiest one to maybe solve for why it doesn't matter which one you choose so i have this negative x this turns into a negative one equals three since i'm going to replace y with a negative one so now to solve for x i have to add a one to both sides so it's going to be negative x equals four then to get rid of this negative i have to divide both sides by negative one or divide both sides by negative and 
the signs will switch and you get X equals negative four. So what this means is the system is gonna be consistent and independent because there's only one solution. And the solution would be represented as an ordered pair. So remember the X value goes first, so the negative four would go first and the negative one has to go second because in an ordered pair, the X, Y is the order that we do in an ordered pair. So that's how we could solve an equation using what's called the elimination method. Some more examples. So if I want to solve the system equations, so notice how this 5x minus y equals 21, 2x plus 3y equals 12. Notice I wrote it side by side because by looking at it, it felt like solving for y would be pretty easy. So I'm going to go ahead and just use what's called the substitution method. So the negative y is going to stay put, and I'm going to move the 5x or subtract 5x on both sides, and this gives me this negative 5x plus this 21. And then to make this negative disappear, I got to divide everything by a negative or a negative one. So it turns into a positive. The negative 5x turns into a positive 5x, and the plus 21 turns into a negative 21. So what we do now is we substitute the 5x minus 21 in for y in the second equation. So this becomes then 2x plus three times 5x minus 21 is equal to 12. And then to solve this equation, we have to simplify the left side, remove the parentheses first. So that's gonna be 2x plus 15x minus 63 is equal to 12. So this becomes now 17x minus 63 is equal to 12. If I had a 63 on both sides, I'm gonna get 17x equals 75. If I divide both sides by 17, how many 17s go into 75? Um, I don't see that happening. If I use a five, that's going to be like 85. So let's pull out a calculator and see what that gives us as an answer. Let's see what we got here. So 75 divided by 17. That's going to equal. And again, my lab does like this. We'll still hit the math button. Use number one for fraction. Notice how it just stays at 7, 75 17. So that doesn't really change anything. So this problem becomes the next equals 75 17. So to find what y is, I can substitute 75 17 back in for x. So y equals um, 5 times. 75 17 minus this 21. So we may go ahead and just use a calculator for that. So if we clear this all off here, five times 75 divided by 17 minus 21. So it's not excuse me, a crazy decimal, so if at the math button, turn that back into a fraction. So it gives me 18 seventeenths. So our solution to that problem should be then, y is gonna equal 18 seventeenths. So again, this would be considered consistent and independent. And our solution would be 75 seventeenths and 18 seventeenths. So unless I just made a mistake, which is highly possible, but that's kind of the, the gist of the math though. So let's look at this next example. I have one half X plus one third Y equals three, one fourth X minus two thirds Y equals negative one. If I want to solve this equation, one thing is I don't like to deal with fractions. So, uh, We've learned that you can get rid of fractions by multiplying each side by the common denominator. 
Well, between a two and a three, a comma multiple would be a six. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this side by six, as long as I multiply this side by six. Remember the way I multiply fractions is I just start with the denominator and divide it into the numerator. So two goes into six three times. Three times one X would be three X. Then I have to multiply the six times this one third Y. And I just start with the three and say three goes into six twice. Two times one Y would be two Y. And then on the other side, I'd have three times six would be 18. So it'd be the new equation. Also, let's get rid of fractions on this bottom one here. A four and a three, a common multiple there would be like a 12. So both of them could be divided by, a 12 can be divided by both of those. So I'm gonna use a 12 here, as long as I'm apply the side over here by 12. So again, I'm gonna start with the denominator. Four goes to 12 three times. Three times one X would be three X. Three times, three goes to 12 four times. Four times negative two would be negative eight Y. And then negative one times 12 would be negative 12. Now, I want to use the elimination method. And notice how I have the same number, just wrong signs. So what I'm going to do is multiply the bottom one by a negative one. But I'm going to multiply both sides by negative one. So I'm going to bring this down here. So 3x plus 2 by the top equation, I don't have to do anything with it. But the bottom equation, I'm going to multiply by negative one, which means all the signs are going to change. So this is going to be a negative 3x plus 8y is equal to 12. So then I'm allowed to add these two equations together. The three X, the negative three X will zero out. I have 10 Y equals 30. So if I divide both sides by 10, Y is gonna equal three. So what I wanna do now is substitute three back in to one of the equations. This three X plus two Y equals 18 looks fairly easy to deal with. So I'm gonna deal with that one. You can choose any one you want up there. The one that doesn't have fractions doesn't bother me as bad. So I'm gonna choose that equation. It doesn't matter which one you use. I have four up there. And I'm gonna substitute three in for y. So this is gonna be three x plus two times three is equal to 18. So this is gonna be three x plus six equals 18. Subtract six on both sides. Three x is gonna equal 12. Divide both sides by three, x equals four. So that's how again, we had just one solution. So we would describe this as consistent and independent. Like I said, most of them are gonna be this way. And the solution would be um, the, or the point of intersection if we're talking about graphing, it would be four, three, if I write it as an ordered pair. So if I look at this next one, we don't have any fractions, but what we're trying to do is figure out which one can I eliminate? Well, it doesn't matter which variable we eliminate. The, the catch is you got to multiply the equations by something that creates the same exact number, but different in sign. What I'm seeing is this y looks fairly friendly because if I just multiply this bottom one by a three, it's going to make a six, but I need a positive six. So I'd have to multiply the bottom one by a negative three. So I'm actually going to go after the y's this time. So I'm going to multiply each side by a negative three. So again, the top equation, I'm still leaving it alone. That's just the way mine turns out. And I'm gonna apply this negative three through, and that's gonna give me a negative 15 X. And negative three times negative two is gonna be a positive six Y like we wanted. And negative three times five would be negative 15. So we multiply both sides by that negative three, property of equality. So negative 15 X and a three X, that's gonna give me a negative 12 X. The six, the negative six Y and the six Y will zero out and seven, and a negative 15, it looks like that's gonna be a negative eight. So now I have to divide both sides by a negative 12. So it's gonna give me negative eight over negative 12. We know that a negative and a negative makes a positive, that's gonna be eight twelfths. And I can divide both of those by four, that's gonna give me two thirds. So I get two thirds as my answer. So now I have to substitute this back in four X. It looks like this top equation may be friendlier because that three looks like it goes with the denominator much easier than that five does. So that's, that's gonna help me out a little bit to save me some time. So I'm gonna use substitution or I'm gonna substitute the two thirds back into the other equation. So I have three X minus six Y is equal to seven. I'm now gonna replace the X with two thirds. 
minus 6y equals 7. So again, before you make, do any math, you just have to look and study things a little bit. So the 3 will go into 3 and divide out. So this leaves me then um, 2 minus 6y is equal to 7. So then I can subtract 2 on both sides. So negative 6y is going to equal uh, a 5. And then if I divide both sides by a negative 6, y equals going to equal a negative 5, 6. So now, so again, there was just one solution. So again, this is going to be consistent and independent. And our solution would be 2 thirds um, negative 5, 6 as a point of intersection. And that's why algebraic would be important because solving graphically, it would be hard to find the exact answer as those decimals. So the last thing in this section is you may have to do an application. So movie theater tickets, you'll, you'll see this one quite often in system of equations. Um, so it's kind of a beginning level uh, system of equations type of uh, application. So movie theater charges $9 for adults and $7 for senior citizens. On one day, uh, when 325 people paid for admission, the total receipts were uh, $2,495. How many who paid were adults and how many uh, were senior citizens? Now, again, to solve this, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. One is, you know, just guess and check. So I know there, there's 325 people all together. Um, you know, from my experience, senior citizens are not going to be the majority of the crowd. So I may just say, you know, there's 325 people there. I may just say 200 were adults. So if, if 200 were adults, they don't look like I read that very, write that, wrote that very well. What I pick up on is what I do with that. Well, that tells me that 325 take away 200 would give me 125 seniors, senior citizens. So, well, is that right? Well, that's the first part. You know, the, the, the adults and the seniors had to add up to this 325. So I'm picking up on that. The other thing is the... Receipts was 2,495. The way the receipts are calculated is you're going to pay $9 times 200 since there's 200 adults, excuse me, attending. And you're going to multiply $7 times 125 seniors. So if I do that math and I'm going to just let the calculator do that for me, I could see if I can piece that together. So I'll clear this off. Um, so nine times 200 plus seven times 125, and that gives me 2,675. So my guess was pretty good, but it looks like I overshot so by a little bit. So I have a feeling that it wasn't 200 adults, it was probably a little bit under that, but I'm really, really close just by guess and check. So I could keep guessing and checking if I wanted to, to solve this problem, but I'm actually gonna solve it algebraically. Notice that there's two unknowns here, adults and senior citizens. So what I could do is say, let X represent the number of adults, because that's what I was looking for. And also we don't know what the number of seniors is, so I can let Y equal the number of seniors. By doing this, this creates a two variable equation since we have basically two unknowns. One of the things I picked up on is this 325. Notice how we understood that the number of adults plus the number of seniors must total this 325. And what we also picked up on is if I multiply $9 times the number of adults, plus $7 times the number of seniors, that's supposed to give me 
2,495. Well, one of the things I picked up on is, you know, the seniors is going to be, you know, I can calculate the seniors by going 325 take away X. In other words, if I solve one of the, for one of the variables, I can pick up on that as substitution method. So notice how we kind of subtracted. We had the, the 325 and we subtracted the adults. Well, that's how we get the seniors. So by using the substitution method, we can kind of do the same thing. Y equals 325 minus X. And then I can actually substitute that in for Y and I have nine times X plus seven times 325 minus X equals 24.95. So to me, the only math I really need here is this 325 times seven. Well, let me just do that over here, 325 times seven. So that's gonna give me what, 35, 14, 17, 21, 22. So that's gonna be nine X plus 22.75 minus seven X equals this 24.95. Now to solve this for X, we still got to combine like terms and that would be two X plus 22.75 equals 24.95. So if I subtract 2.75 on each side, so this is going to give me two X and I might have to do that somewhere. I'll do that over here. Just some scratch work, 24.95. I'm going to subtract 22.75. I can see math a little bit better down the page sometimes. So zero, that's going to be a two, that's going to be 220. So 2x is going to equal 220. And if I divide both sides by two, then I end up with x equals 110. So what I'm picking up on is 110 would be the number of uh, adults. So if I do 325, take away 110, so 325 take away 110, we have five, two, one, we have 125, that makes sense, 100, and, oops, I'm sorry, 225, yeah, 225 would make better sense there, so actually 225 seniors. So we're picking up on that there's gonna be 110 adults, and there's gonna be 225 seniors. So my thinking was obviously wrong. I thought there would be more adults than seniors. So if we verify that, checking it out, you know, nine times 110 plus seven times the 225, that's supposed to give me the receipts of 2495. So see if it actually does that. So I have um, nine times 110 plus seven times 225, that does give me, um, gives me 2565. So that ain't right. So that gave us not the right answer. So where did we go wrong? That's what happens when you do math by hand. So let me see what seven times 325 was, see if I made a mistake, just trying to do stuff by hand. 2275, that was right. Let's see here. What's 2495? So like 2495 minus 2275. That's 220. And what is 220? divided by two, that is one tens, huh? Interesting. So let me, so if the one, one tens, right, then I must have messed up with 325, take away one ten, the most basic math, five minus zero was five, two minus one was one, three minus one was two. I should have had a 215 for my seniors. So let me see if that makes a difference in the problem because I was only off a little bit, but it makes a difference. So, so if I check it, I should have had a 215 there. Let's see if that made a difference. So 
you can kind of tell I'm getting a little rusty as well with um, doing math by hand. So I think I lost my calculator. Go back here, calculator. So if I clear that off and do that again, nine times 110 plus seven times 215, that does give me my 2495. So it does check out now. So that's just part of doing math. Okay, so that concludes our lesson on systems of equations.